This is Eric again, and today I'll be finishing the video subset on tachyarrhythmias by providing you some unknown examples to practice and then reviewing them. As this is an extension from the previous video on how to diagnose almost any tachyarrhythmia with six easy questions, the learning objective is the same. To keep the video as short as possible, and because people take different lengths of time to review, I'll only wait a moment after showing each EKG before going into the discussion. I recommend pausing the video and taking as long as necessary for you to develop your own opinion about the diagnosis. And I highly recommend using the six easy questions from the last video, which will serve as the framework around which I analyze each rhythm. To very briefly review, these are those questions. Question one, what is the rhythm's rate? Question two, what is the regularity? Number three, is the QRS complex narrow or wide? Four, what is the atrial activity? Five, what is the relationship of P waves to QRS complexes? And finally, a two-part question, is the onset of the rhythm abrupt or gradual, and does the rate vary? Here's example one. Let's ask the six questions. What is the rate? Using the 10 second rule, we can count 22 QRS complexes across the 10 second rhythm strip, which we then multiply by six to get a rate of about 132. What is the regularity? It is irregularly irregular. Are the QRS complexes narrow or wide? They are narrow. What is the atrial activity? There are no P waves or flutter waves, just small amplitude undulations in the baseline, which are fibrillation waves or F waves with a lowercase f. So we can actually stop the six questions here because we have enough information to say with 100% certainty that this rhythm is atrial fibrillation. Example two. What's the rate? If we use the 300 rule, there are slightly less than three big boxes between successive QRS complexes, which means that the rate is slightly faster than 100. If we wanted a slightly more precise estimate, which isn't generally necessary, we can use the 10 second rule. There are 18 QRS complexes across the recording, which means the rate is more precisely 108 beats per minute. The rhythm is regular. It is narrow complex. What about the atrial activity? Well, there are P waves this time, and they appear to have normal morphology. In particular, they are upright in lead two and downgoing in lead AVR. And question five, what is the relationship between P waves and QRS complexes? There is a one-to-one -one relationship with each P preceding each QRS complex, along with a constant PR interval that is less than 200 milliseconds. Thus, our diagnosis here is sinus tachycardia. Example three. You'll notice that the arrangement of leads is different here than in a standard 12 lead EKG. You could refer to this as a six lead rhythm strip, but the steps to assessing the rhythm are the same. Estimation of the heart rate is a little tricky because we can't use a 10 second rule since the strip is not 10 seconds long, and the number of big boxes between each QRS complex falls somewhere between one and two, which gives us a big range of rate that falls somewhere between 150 and 300. Is there any way to be more precise? If you remember that each large box is 200 milliseconds, that means there are five large boxes in one second. So let's see how many QRS complexes occur in one second. Looking here, for example, we see that in each one second interval, there are almost exactly three complete cardiac cycles. Three cardiac cycles in one second means 180 cardiac cycles in one minute. Therefore, the rate is about 180 beats per minute. It's regular, but this time the QRS width is slightly greater than 120 milliseconds, so it's a wide complex tachycardia. Do you see any atrial activity? There certainly isn't anything very regular or obvious, but if you look very closely, 
you can see that there are rarely some extra bumps in the waveforms that come at different times. Probably the clearest example occurs right here in lead 2, which corresponds to these similar bumps in 3 in AVF, and even 1 in AVR. If you saw this in just a single lead, you might speculate it was artifact or noise, and of no consequence. However, seeing it in four different leads simultaneously strongly suggests it's something real, and that something real is a dissociated P wave. Are there any other dissociated P waves? There are. These aren't as obvious, but look at the T wave two beats earlier. Notice anything different about them? For example, in lead two, that T wave is just a little bit taller than the others. The same can be said of the T waves in 3 and AVF. And the T wave in AVR is just a little bit deeper than the others. The reason for this is another dissociated P wave that happens to strike at the exact peak of the T wave. So summarizing our findings, we have an unusually rapid, regular, wide complex tachycardia with dissociated P waves. You can be very certain this is ventricular tachycardia which is obviously the monomorphic subtype. Example 4. Using the 10 second rule, there are 23 QRS complexes across the EKG, so the rate is 23 times 6, or 138. It is irregularly irregular and has narrow complexes. The atrial activity flutter waves at a rate of about 300, best seen in the inferior leads and V1. Therefore, this tachyarrhythmia is atrial flutter with variable AV block. Example 5. You may immediately notice that this strip has two distinctly separate rhythm issues. The first third is a bradyarrhythmia, but we are going to focus on just the other two thirds. So the rate, it's very hard to say since it's irregularly irregular and we don't have a full 10 seconds to evaluate it, but we can very approximately estimate that it's somewhere between 200 and 250 beats per minute. Usually, once the rate exceeds 200, an exact number is not very helpful. It's irregularly irregular, as just mentioned, and the QRS complexes are wide. We could stop right there since we already have a probable diagnosis, but for instructive purposes, let's see if we can identify any atrial activity. There's nothing consistent, but occasionally there are some bumps in the waveforms that look suspicious for dissociated P waves. We can't be nearly as certain as we were in the monomorphic VT from example 3, because with the ever-changing QRS complex morphologies here, those bumps may just represent funny things going on in the QRS but it looks suspicious. So we have an extremely fast, irregularly irregular, wide complex tachycardia with possible dissociated P waves. This is polymorphic VT. Although this has not been discussed in this video series yet, there is one more interesting feature of this EKG that is seen in the first third we were initially ignoring. Immediately before the onset of the tachyarrhythmia, there is a specific pattern of QRS complexes, often referred to as long-short, meaning that the two RR intervals immediately preceding the rhythm onset consist of one unusually long RR interval and one unusually short one. This specific pattern, which will be discussed in a future video, means that this polymorphic VT is the torsade de pointe subtype, which is almost universally associated with a prolonged QT interval. Although, in this particular example, it's impossible to say what that QT interval actually is. Example 6. The tachyarrhythmia begins just in the last one quarter of the EKG. The rate is about 150. It is regular and narrow complex. During the tachyarrhythmia, there are no visible P waves at all, so we can't say anything about AV dissociation, though it would be phenomenally rare to see AV dissociation with narrow complexes. Although it has not come up yet in the five prior examples, 
Do you remember question number six? Part of question six asks whether the onset is abrupt or gradual. It looks like a very abrupt onset here, one which followed a pre premature atrial contraction. A regular, narrow complex rhythm with no visible atrial activity and abrupt onset is almost certainly a supraventricular tachycardia, or SVT. This rhythm is occasionally referred to as a PSVT, with the P standing for paroxysmal. In the event that you saw the rate was 150 and was considering this could be atrial flutter, that's a good thought, and it could be, which is why I stated that this is almost certainly an SVT. With a lot of experience, you'd realize that with the very flat baseline in between QRS complexes, it's highly improbable that there are tiny flutter waves hiding in there. But if you wanted to change your 99% certainty to 100% certainty, you could perform a vagal maneuver or give adenosine to see if and how the rhythm responds. Example 7. There are just under three large boxes between successive QRS complexes, so the rate is just over 100. There are 17 and a half complexes across the strip for a more precise rate estimate of 105. It's regular and wide complex. Do you see P waves? Yes, they are most clear in lead one, but also unambiguous in two and AVF, and the morphology seems about normal. What is the relationship between P and QRS? Each P precedes a QRS, and each QRS follows a P. The PR interval is constant and less than 200 milliseconds. Putting everything together, this is sinus tack. So why are the QRS complexes wide if the rhythm is not ventricular? Remember the four causes of wide QRS complexes besides a ventricular rhythm. They are bundle branch block, pre-excitation, class 1 antiarrhythmics, and profound hyperkalemia. Although we are given nothing about the patient's history, the morphology of these complexes are classic for a left bundle branch block. Specifically, there is a broad R wave in 1 AVL and V6, without either a little Q wave or a significant S wave, and there is ST depressions and T wave inversions in those same leads. In addition, the complex in V1 consists of a deep QS complex with no R wave and is followed by mild ST elevation and prominent T waves. Classic left bundle branch block. Example 8. Using the 10 second rule, with 25 QRS complexes across the 10 second strip, the overall rate is about 150. It's clearly irregularly irregular and narrow complex. What about the atrial activity? Let's zoom in on lead 2 in the rhythm strip. There is clearly a small discrete waveform before most of the QRS complexes. These are P waves, but you can see that there are many different morphologies, and no one morphology seems to be particularly predominant. The QRS complexes that don't seem to be preceded by a P wave may simply have P waves that are too small to be seen, or ones that are obscured by the preceding T wave. So in summary, this is an irregularly irregular, narrow complex rhythm with three or more different P wave morphologies and without any one specific predominant P wave. Thus, this is by definition multifocal atrial tachycardia. For the last two examples, I'll give you something more challenging. Example 9. And for this one, I'll give you an additional clue. Here is the data from the inpatient telemetry monitor displaying the heart rate as a function of time. Uh, this rhythm obviously occurs during the period when the patient is tachycardic. Going through the six questions, there is about two and a half large boxes between successive QRS complexes, suggesting a rate in the mid-120s. With the 10 second rule, you would estimate about 126. It's regular and narrow complex. What about atrial activity? If you look very closely, you'll notice that there really isn't any visible activity. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean there is no atrial activity, 
because it could be of such low amplitude we can't see it on the surface EKG, or perhaps there are P waves that are buried within the QRS complexes, but we can't really see them. Without the telemetry data, we couldn't say for certain that this wasn't sinus tachycardia with extreme low amplitude P waves. However, sinus tach does not happen instantaneously as the telemetry shows, nor does it have a complete lack of rate variability. So if this isn't sinus tach, what is it? A regular narrow complex rhythm with abrupt onset and no variability must be either an SVT or atrial flutter with two to one block. The overall ventricular rate is unusual for both of those possibilities, but there really isn't any other explanation. So the EKG must represent one of them. There is absolutely nothing to suggest flutter waves in the inferior leads or V1, and the tiny R prime waveform seen in V3 could be a P wave tacked onto the back of a QRS, both of which are more suggestive that this is an SVT. However, the general appearance of the baseline in V5 and V6 looks vaguely sawtooth to me, suggesting more a flutter. But those are unusual leads of which to see flutter waves. The bottom line, I think it's impossible to say which of these two rhythms we actually have without additional diagnostic maneuvers such as carotid sinus massage or adenosine. Unfortunately, there are rare occasions in which the EKG alone will be insufficient to make a definitive rhythm diagnosis. Finally, example 10. Rate is about 150 and it's regular. Regarding the QRS complex width, it's just at 120 milliseconds, so straddles the border of narrow or wide complex. What about the atrial activity? This is the tricky question. Most trainees don't see any atrial activity at all here, and it would not be unexpected for someone to reach the conclusion that a borderline wide complex tachycardia was probably VT. However, let's look very closely at lead V1. Do you notice any atrial activity now? There is activity, and in fact, it's very regular. You can see tiny bumps at the tail end of each T wave. Okay, so maybe this is just sinus tack, lay borderline wide QRS due to a left bundle branch block. We saw that before a few examples ago. That's another good thought, but let's actually zoom in on V1. Not only is there regular, consistent atrial activity at the tail end of each T, there is also a tiny bump at the very beginning of the ST segment. If you assume that this was part of the QRS complex, that's completely understandable, but I can tell you with much experience that you will realize that those bumps superimposed on the beginning of the ST segment are the exact same ones superimposed on the end of the T wave. Thus, there is regular atrial activity occurring at a rate of about 300 beats per minute in a regular tachycardia whose overall rate is about 150 beats per minute. So what's this rhythm actually? It's atrial flutter with two to one AV block. Can we be 100% certain of that from this EKG alone? No, not 100% certain, but I'd arbitrarily say about 99.5% certain. That's it for these examples of how to diagnose tachyarrhythmias with six easy questions. I hope you found going through them was helpful.